What's going on, everyone? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. It's hard to believe that the BP oil spill took place over four years ago, considering how powerful the effects on the Gulf still are today. But after BP agreed to pay $4.5 billion to the government and another $9.2 billion in civil penalties, a brand new ruling has put BP in the spotlight like never before. Just this week, a U.S. district judge found BP as being grossly negligent and its subcontractors Halliburton and Transocean negligent in regards to the 2010 oil spill. Under the Clean Water Act, the new ruling could effectively quadruple the penalty per barrel spill that BP will have to pay. But if you've been paying attention, BP's criminal negligence shouldn't come as a surprise. See, after nine years at sea, BP management acknowledged that the deepwater drilling rig was in decline and presented a, quote, intolerable risk to safety. But according to Fortune magazine, there were barely any safety standards in place, adding that, quote, BP had strict guidelines barring employees from carrying a cup of coffee without a lid, but no standard procedure for how to conduct a negative pressure test, a critical last step in avoiding a blowout. And Halliburton pled guilty to the to the destruction of key evidence related to the company's shady cost-cutting practices, like failing to inspect the well's cement mixture and using only six of the recommended 21 centralizers to secure the drill site. Basically, everything about the operation was unsafe. Between the deliberate lack of safety and the faulty equipment used, the Deepwater Horizon spill was an accident waiting to happen. All this aside, shockingly, BP's contracts with the Defense Department have more than doubled in the years since the disaster, according to Bloomberg. Well, I recently went down to the Louisiana Gulf Coast to see how the region is faring nearly five years later and to investigate the lasting damages for myself. So stick around because it's time to break the set. It was a terrible mistake. And we're working very hard to make, make up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Besides the massive damage that's been done to the environment as a result of the BP disaster, the health impact on humans, particularly those who helped clean up the spill, continues to this day. This is largely because of the decision by BP and the EPA to spray nearly 2 million gallons of an oil dispersant called Corexit on top of the water, which made the oil 52 times more toxic, according to a 2012 study published in the Environmental Pollution Journal. So to see how one cleanup worker is coping nearly five years later, breaking the set producer Cody Snell went down to the Gulf to investigate. The fifth anniversary of the worst accidental oil spill in history is just months away. And according to BP, the Gulf is finally back to normal. I'm glad to report all beaches and waters are open for everyone to enjoy. But despite the countless ads put out by the company to clean up its image after spilling nearly five million barrels of oil into the water, a cursory survey of the shorelines of Louisiana suggests a very different narrative. Here on Grand Isle, Louisiana, where the beach meets the Gulf of Mexico, thousands of tar balls like these continue to wash on shore over four years after the BP oil spill. And it's no wonder, considering that the spill directly impacted an area the size of Oklahoma, changing hundreds of thousands of lives in the process. Lives like Jory Danos, a former cleanup employee who worked on a skimmer boat for three months after the spill. Along with the oil itself, Danos was directly exposed to a chemical oil dispersant called Corexit. Almost two million gallons of the substance was sprayed on top of the oil, which theoretically was supposed to prevent large amounts of crude from reaching the shore. Instead, it made him violently ill. It started with abdominal pain, abdominal pain that was uh, ruthless. It felt like a razor. But Danos, who was in the middle of a civil suit against BP, was hardly the only one that became sick from the oil and subsequent dumping of Corexit. Dr. Michael Robichaud opened a clinic out of his house two years after the spill to treat over 100 cleanup workers, and the shared symptoms he observed 
shocked him. Patients from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana all had identical problems. Very bizarre problems, things that I had never seen before. These problems include everything from memory loss to respiratory disorders. Now, it's possible that the severity of these conditions may have been reduced with proper protective gear during the cleanup, but according to Danos, it was never provided. The respirators was, you know, uncalled for. I uncalled for because of bad media attention, um, and I'd be relieved of my duties because it wasn't toxic. And that's what they said. It was safe as dishwasher liquid. Jonathan Henderson, an organizer with the Gulf Coast Restoration Network, who has surveyed the Gulf over 200 times, corroborates Danos's allegation. Despite what BP claims, I have photos and video of workers, you know, with BP supervisors and Coast Guard, where they're sucking up oil out of the marsh and they're not wearing respirators. They're not all they're doing is wearing a pair of gloves. Wilma Subra, an award-winning toxicologist who has tested the blood and tissue samples of countless cleanup workers, was stunned by what she saw as well. This was 2010, and this was absolutely unacceptable for workers to be exposed and made ill in 2010 in a workplace environment. Earlier this summer, BP finally started paying out medical claims for oil spill victims. But as of this broadcast, only 148 of over 10,000 claims have been approved, with the average settlement amounting to a mere $1,600. Furthermore, according to court documents, the conditions covered by the settlement are easily treatable and cost-effective, such as a runny nose and facial pressure, and vastly different from those observed by Dr. Robichaux. They came up with a, a list of illnesses that were, at very best, and I'm going to be a little vulgar here because I'm PO'd at them, chicken sh at best. A BP spokesperson later released a statement to Breaking the Set, writing, the same ingredients containing Corexit are also found in common consumer products such as household cleaners, food packaging, hand lotion, and cosmetics. The product ingredients alone do not determine if a compound has created a public health concern. There must also be exposure to a compound at levels and for sufficient duration that could cause harm. Due to the controls in place during dispersant application operations, there was little potential for public or worker exposure when dispersants were applied to the oil offshore. But those words are of little comfort to people like Jory Danos, who worries he won't live long enough to see his three daughters grow up. Big corporation can try to take me down, but I'm just a little peon that's trying to fight and make everybody understand what's really going on down here. For Breaking the Set, this is Cody Snell in Louisiana. Now that you've gotten a sense of just how much harm the oil and toxic dispersant has inflicted on the people of the Gulf, it's also important to understand the science behind it. So while in New Orleans, I sat down with award-winning toxicologist Wilma Subra, who's done countless blood and tissue samples, tests on Gulf residents, cleanup workers, and wildlife in the region in the years following the spill. I started by asking her why the blowout was especially damaging to the Gulf just five years after Hurricane Katrina. In the spring of 2010, the ecosystem was starting to heal itself, and the fishermen were thinking this was going to be their good spring catch, and they were going to be able to make money because they had lost money all those other years. And that's when the BP disaster occurred and just wiped out all the fishing grounds. Immediately, the agencies banned any harvesting in the fishing grounds. And so as a result of that, a lot of the fishermen thought they knew the estuaries best, and they volunteered to be cleanup workers for BP and BP contractors. And as a result of being cleanup workers, they were severely exposed to the crude and to the dispersants. They were skin rashes, they were headaches, they were nausea, they were memory loss, and those people are still very, very ill four years later. Let's talk specifically about the major dispersant that BP used to spray the oil in the aftermath of the spill called Corexit. What exactly does this chemical comprise of and why is it so toxic to humans and wildlife? In the aquatic tissue, it was polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons like benzoate pyrene, which are long lasting in the environment. They don't degrade quickly. And that was one of the major things in the aquatic tissue, the shrimp the oysters, the crabs, and the fin fish. Then in the community, the 
cleanup workers and those living along the coastal areas. I did blood samples for volatile organics, the benzene, toluene, and I found elevated levels in the blood of those chemicals to that the people were actually be, still being exposed because it was still washing on shore. And then the other portion is as that slick lay in the Gulf, even with the use of the Corexit as a dispersant, there was still a very large slick that lasted well into August of 2010. But every time the wind would get really strong or the, the tide would have a lot of waves, it would change it into an aerosol, sort of like a spray, hair spray, and it would wash on shore and come on shore in the air. And it came inshore over 100 miles and it made people very, very ill just from breathing it. Well, why was Corexic approved by the EPA and what was BP's justification for using it? BP had two goals when the disaster occurred. One, to stop the flow from the well. And we know that didn't work. It took very, very long time. And two, to stop the crude from making it to the shores in Louisiana and impacting the coastal marsh. And it took nine days before it made it to the coastal marsh, and it's been washing on shore ever since. So that's why they wanted to use the dispersant. And in the command center were all the federal agencies and BP. And we would hear that BP would threaten them. If they made a decision counter to what BP wanted, then BP said to the agencies, you're going to be liable for any of the damage caused by your decision. And then as the situation occurred, the administrator of EPA, Lisa Jackson, issued a directive to BP to come up with less toxic dispersants. And so when that report came out, and it came out on a weekend, most of the information on it was redacted, blacked out so you couldn't read it. But the issue was that one, yes, there were less toxic dispersants, but two, BP insisted they were not available in sufficient quantity to be able to continue to address the slip. Wilma, how many people are still sick and dying from the spill? My estimate along the coastal areas is hundreds of thousands of people are ill as a result of their exposure. If you take the health symptoms and you look at the health symptoms that are in the settlements, they don't match. So as a result of this, the people who are being made very ill by being exposed are not part of the settlement. The other piece is BP was allowed to put together a large package to provide health care in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, primary health care. Now, Louisiana and Mississippi are at the bottom of the list of health care, primary health care. And we, we don't doubt that. But BP was allowed to put money into primary health care, and the criteria excluded the health symptoms that were the result of the exposure to crude. Well, BP has claimed that the tens of thousands of air monitoring samples that were done by both them and the government were actually well below safety concerns. What's your response to that claim, Wilma? Most of the data that BP generated are that BP contractors are university people that were under contract with BP. Most of that data is not available. So we can't look at it and see. We've seen a little bit of their data, and they're trying to argue that the toxicity is way below health standards. But when you look at the samples that non-BP associated researchers did, it's demonstrating that it's in the toxicity range. How did you react to the news that BP was actually approved to drill again in the Gulf? You have to understand this is Louisiana, and oil and gas are king. And so the industry usually gets to do whatever they ask for. Well, why do you think there hasn't been more resistance from the local community and elected representatives in terms of giving BP this new contract? All of these families that have been impacted are made up of fishing communities, and oil field workers. And a lot of the fishing community didn't want to speak out because their cousin or their brother worked for the oil and gas industry, and they were afraid they would lose their jobs as well. So it's, it's 
a really complex situation because every family has people that work in both occupations. And so you don't want to cause anything that another member in your family will result in losing their job. Well, well what can we do to hold BP accountable? The media needs to tell the story, and the media just got fatigued about hearing what was going on very, very quickly. And they think, oh, it's all gone, it's fine. It's not all gone. It's not all gone, and it's not fine. After the break, I'll cover how the seafood industry has been impacted by BP. And if you like what you see so far, be sure to chime in on Twitter using the hashtag StandUpToBP. We'll be right back. Are you like me? Do you want your comedy news with some teeth? Do you want your comedy news to be a bare-fisted, no-holds-barred fight to the death? Like a truth vampire biting into the necks of the corporate elite and the billionaire freaks while they're going, ah, ah, make it stop! Well, that's what you get with my new show, Redacted Tonight. Is that too much? I, I, I think that was too much. Marinade, join me on Boom Bus for in-depth, impartial, and en vogue financial reporting, commentary, interviews, and much, much more. Only on Boom Bus and only on RT. Water horizon explosion pumped 210 million gallons of toxic sludge into the ecosystem, killing 11 people in the process. Not to mention affecting up to 16,000 miles of coastline between every state from Texas to Florida. But if you go by BP's word, the Gulf is primed for tourism and has made a full recovery from the catastrophe. This Louisiana seafood is delicious. We're having such a great year on the Gulf. We've decided to put aside our rival. Now is the perfect time to visit any one of our states. The beaches and waters couldn't be more beautiful. Take a boat ride, go fishing, or just lay in the sun. We've got coastline to explore and wildlife to photograph. Photographs like the one I took of these massive tar balls still washing ashore nearly five years later. And despite BP's unrelenting PR campaign, study after study has shown that the environment is still suffering dire consequences. By far the biggest visible impact has been on birds. In the first six months after the spill, nearly 40% of observed birds showed clear signs of oil exposure. Since, researchers have used publicly available data to estimate that as many as 1.2 million birds have been killed as a direct result of the spill. Moving on to ocean critters, where there's been a record-shattering 26 consecutive months of above-average dead dolphins washing ashore since the disaster, according to the National Wildlife Federation. Sea turtles have also fared horribly, with five times as many found dead than before 2010. Turtles are especially vulnerable to oil spills because of the sensitivities of their life cycles. Keep in mind that these are the mammals and fauna most visible to oil effects. The fish and invertebrates in the ocean have been catastrophically impacted from their ability to spawn to grow without deformities. The true toll on these creatures nearly impossible to determine. Furthermore, the Fish and Wildlife Service has concluded that 36 national wildlife refuges have been impacted, many of which are host to endangered species and critical migratory stops. While in New Orleans, I spoke with Jonathan Henderson, organizer of the nonprofit advocacy group Gulf Restoration Network, about how we'll never truly know the harm done to voiceless marine life. We're never going to know the true toll that this disaster has had on the wildlife because most of the animals and critters that died have never been counted. Uh, take fish, for example, and marine mammals, and you know, uh, anything offshore. When it dies, it's probably going to float for a little while and then sink. Um, and so it's never going to wash ashore. 
and it's never going to be counted. So we don't know how many turtles died. We don't know how many dolphins died. We don't know how many whales died. Uh, and it's the same with, with birds. If you know, a bird gets, gets impacted and it flies away, it might die somewhere else. It's not going to conveniently die where researchers are, are counting the birds. As someone who grew up on the Gulf Coast and was obsessed with the beach as a child, Jonathan says that the once vibrant shore has become a virtual graveyard. I have personally uh, seen fish with lesions, shrimp with no eyes. I've, uh, just a, a couple months ago, I found a dead, another dead dolphin uh, down in Barataria Bay. Uh, I've been to areas that seem devoid of, of the life, of the abundance of of alive, of life, that, that were there before the BP disaster. You know, you go to some areas on the coast that were heavily impacted and you, you don't see any birds flying around. You don't see the, the shrimp uh, jumping in the water. You don't see the, uh, the, uh, the crickets and the insects. Indeed, from insects to dolphins, everything in the food chain has taken a toll that will never be truly understood. And while humans affected by BP's negligence have the ability to seek compensation, don't forget that these animals have no legal recourse for justice. Since May of 2010, BP has paid out approximately $11 billion to individuals and businesses affected by the spill, according to the company's own website. The money, however, has done little to fill the fishing nets that once fueled the thriving seafood industry on the Gulf Coast. While I was in Louisiana, I had a chance to sit down with Clint Guidry, president of the Louisiana Shrimpers Association, and I first asked him to outline why the seafood industry is so important to the region. Before we were the United States of America, you know, we had people living in these communities fishing. So it's very important to the state, uh, cultural, culturally, and also economically, uh, not just on the sales of seafood, but tourism. You know, a lot of people come to this state to experience our our way of life, and part of that is the good cooking and the good seafood, the good wild caught seafood. And how are fishermen still affected today by the 2010 spill? Uh, there's been about, uh, we did the numbers on the different estuaries that were uh, heavily impacted by the oil, where the oil actually came in. And uh, uh, on the east side of the river, uh, it's shrimp a little bit, but more oysters. Or the oyster guys on the east side really took a hit. They're unable to harvest any oysters. Baratari Bay is about 30% off on pounds of shrimp produced. Uh, some of the offshore grids uh, surrounding the well, uh, there were some pretty good uh, fishing areas, uh, are just about gone dry, nothing. Can you break down the entire settlement's claim process for fishermen? Some of the same problems and some of the same issues we had with all of the processes, uh, uh, being able to document claims, uh, losing documentation where you have to keep resubmitting the same documentation over and over and over and over. Uh, anything to stall the process. I know, I know a lot of guys who have not finished, qualified guys, documented guys, who have not received the first check out of the first round, much right. less even we haven't even gotten to the second round yet. What precautions are fishermen taking to prepare for the next oil spill? How do you prepare for the next oil spill? Uh, you know, some of the things we've done since Katrina, as a matter of fact, I was working on that this morning, uh, establishing safe harbors for the, uh, for the guys in Lower Plaquemine that lost all their fishing vessels during the hurricane, where they'll be able to uh, give an advance notice, they'll be able to get to safe harbor where their vessels and their boats and their businesses, you know, will be protected. Uh, what's happening on the, believe it or not, you know, the Oil Spill Commission put out some really, really good stuff. And I don't know of anything that they said or advised the president to do was ever done. <laughs> I met with those guys. I had different meetings with them, gave testimony, and they came out with a very good report on how to fix this problem. And I, I just don't see any of that uh, has happened or will happen. And we have a very good, strong base of organizations, community organizations, nonprofits that work their butts off uh, taking care of the people they represent. 
uh, the fish people, oyster people, same thing. Uh, we have very good uh, relations with our state government. Uh, we uh, communicate and go to Washington, D.C. all the time. And, and that's, that's, that's the key. That's the key to really any disaster is having that rapport and having that structure set up where when it happens, you have people to react to it. And you know you have people that experience at doing what they need to do, you know, to get the guys help. Clint, you were talking earlier about a PR playbook on behalf of oil companies whenever there's a large scale spill. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that playbook is. Right now, BP's got most of the people in the country and the world believing that we're all fine now and everything's wonderful. They did such a wonderful job. It's like they think that these people are going to invite them to come into the community and completely kill everything around them, you know? Let's just cover the whole community with all. Hey, we, you know, we're wonderful guys. They have spent close to a billion dollars on, on, uh, on uh, promoting themselves. My friend Dean Blanchett uh, always says BP stands for bad people. And that's, that's a pretty good analogy, bad people. Because the one thing we haven't talked about is the 11 guys who died. They actually killed people doing what they did. I call them liars and killers. After investigating the destruction of the Gulf and speaking to those actually affected, we wanted to hear BP's side of the story. So we went to a BP research center in Louisiana to try and get some answers. Hey, we're just wondering if someone could talk to the press. It's a representative from BP. In regards to? In regards to a lot of things that are going on here. OK. So you guys have no one at all that can talk to anyone? Sir, can you turn it up, or can you? Leave the building, please. Right now? Yes. Well, shortly after leaving, it wasn't too long before BP had already called my producer in D.C. to find out what the angle of our story would be. And after a couple more inquisitive phone calls, they had said that they had scanned my Twitter and were worried about us fairly covering the story. But to the corporation's credit, it did finally provide a statement regarding our most pressing questions, which we'll link to in the online version of the show. And while it might sound outrageous that BP spent so much time trying to control the narrative of little old breaking the set, let's not forget that the unleashing of PR gnomes is entirely in character for BP. In fact, according to journalist Dar Jamal, BP actually hired a PR firm that ended up harassing online critics of the disaster. Look, the point is that if BP prioritized cleaning up its safety record instead of its image, the people and ecosystem might still look like the sportsman's paradise the company alleges it to be. And although it's great to hear that the company's been found grossly negligent, the penalty is really just a drop in the bucket for one of the largest oil companies in the world, especially considering that no amount of money can ever restore the health and lives of countless humans and ocean creatures. So until the people working in these industries start valuing life over profit, I shudder to think of the tar-covered dystopia we'll be leaving behind. Fifty-two times more toxic, according to a 2012 study published in the Environmental Pollution Journal. So to see how one cleanup worker is coping nearly five years later, breaking the set producer Cody Snell went down to the Gulf to investigate. The fifth anniversary of the worst accidental oil spill in history is just months away. And according to BP, the Gulf is finally back to normal. I'm glad to report all beaches and waters are open for everyone to enjoy. But despite the countless ads put out by the company to clean up its image after spilling nearly 5 million barrels of oil into the water, a cursory survey of the shorelines of Louisiana suggests a very different narrative. Here on Grand Isle, Louisiana, where the beach meets the Gulf of Mexico, thousands of tar balls like these continue to wash on shore over four years after the BP oil spill. And it's no wonder, considering that the spill directly impacted an area the size of Oklahoma, changing hundreds of thousands of lives in the process. Lives like Jory Danos, a former cleanup employee who worked on a skimmer boat for three months after the spill. Along with the oil itself, Danos was directly exposed to a chemical oil dispersant called Corexit. Almost two million gallons of the substance was sprayed on top of the oil, which theoretically was supposed to prevent large amounts of crude from reaching the shore. Instead, it made him violently ill. It started with abdominal pain, abdominal pain that was uh, 
ruthless. It felt like a razor. But Danos, who was in the middle of a civil suit against BP, was hardly the only one that became sick from the oil and subsequent dumping of Corexit. Dr. Michael Robichaud opened a clinic out of his house two years after the spill to treat over 100 cleanup workers, and the shared symptoms he observed shocked him. Patients from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana all had identical problems, very bizarre problems, things that I had never seen before. These problems include everything from memory loss to respiratory disorders. Now, it's possible that the severity of these conditions may have been reduced with proper protective gear during the cleanup, but according to Danos, it was never provided. The respirators was, you know, uncalled for. Uncalled for because of bad media attention, um, and I'd be really... It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make up for it. Once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's... Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on Besides the massive damage that's been done to the environment as a result of the BP disaster, the health impact on humans, particularly those who help clean up the spill, continues to this day. This is largely because of the decision by BP and the EPA to spray nearly 2 million gallons of an oil dispersant called Corexit on top of the water, which made the oil... What's going on, everyone? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. It's hard to believe that the BP oil spill took place over four years ago, considering how powerful the effects on the Gulf still are today. But after BP agreed to pay $4.5 billion to the government and another $9.2 billion in civil penalties, a brand new ruling has put BP in the spotlight like never before. Just this week, a U.S. district judge found BP as being grossly negligent and its subcontractors Halliburton and Transocean negligent in regards to the 2010 oil spill. Under the Clean Water Act, the new ruling could effectively quadruple the penalty per barrel spill that BP will have to pay. But if you've been paying attention, BP's criminal negligence shouldn't come as a surprise. See, after nine years at sea, BP management acknowledged that the deepwater drilling rig was in decline and presented a, quote, intolerable risk to safety. But according to Fortune magazine, there were barely any safety standards in place, adding that, quote, BP had strict guidelines barring employees from carrying a cup of coffee without a lid, but no standard procedure for how to conduct a negative pressure test, a critical last step in avoiding a blowout. And Halliburton pled guilty to the to the destruction of key evidence related to the company's shady cost-cutting practices, like failing to inspect the well's cement mixture and using only six of the recommended 21 centralizers to secure the drill site. Basically, everything about the operation was unsafe. Between the deliberate lack of safety and the faulty equipment used, the Deepwater Horizon spill was an accident waiting to happen. All this aside, shockingly, BP's contracts with the Defense Department have more than doubled in the years since the disaster, according to Bloomberg. Well, I recently went down to the Louisiana Gulf Coast to see how the region is faring nearly five years later and to investigate the lasting damages for myself. So stick around because it's time to break the set.